The show begins with a prologue where Mother Abagail Fremantle delivers a dire warning that the world will face immense loss and the Dark Man will rise in the West, with survivors judged on their ability to confront him. Her prophecy quickly comes true as the scene shifts to the Boulder Free Zone, a community of survivors in Colorado. The virus has already devastated the world, leaving 7 billion people dead. The team is going through houses, clearing out the dead from the pandemic. Harold Lauder, one of the crew members, is deeply affected by the grim task. With the power still out, Norris, the team leader, addresses the crew, acknowledging the difficulty of their work and asking for a show of hands from those willing to return and continue the next day. As Harold prepares to join the cleanup crew again, he reflects on how the outbreak personally impacted him from the beginning. The scene flashes back five months to Maine, where Franny Goldsmith is taking care of her father, who is ill with a cough and fever. Meanwhile, Harold Lauder spies on her through a hole in the fence until a group of bullies arrives and knocks him down. With his bike damaged and feeling defeated, Harold returns home to find his mother coughing in the bedroom. He also receives a rejection letter from a publisher about his book, which adds to his frustration. In a fit of rage, Harold breaks his laptop. Meanwhile, a radio broadcast reports that the small town of Arnett, Texas, has been entirely cut off from the rest of the world by the CDC. At a U.S. Army research facility in Texas, Stu Redman has been held in confinement for the past three days. He had come into contact with a soldier who had crashed into a gas station in Arnett, Texas, and later died from Captain Trips, a deadly virus. The soldier, who had traveled from a bioweapon facility in California, spread the disease on his journey. During a conversation with Dr. Jim Ellis, Stu learns that he is the only person who had contact with the infected soldier, but has not contracted Captain Trips, showing no symptoms of the disease. When Stu inquires about his friends who were with him, Dr. Ellis informs him that they are dead. A report reveals that Stu lost his wife several years ago, when he agrees to undergo tests in order to learn why he is immune. The scene shifts to Harold shouting in the eerily silent streets of his town. The place is deserted, and he spots Franny in her garden, digging a grave for her father. The town's residents are all dead from captain trips, including Franny's father and Harold's mother. Harold mentions that news about the situation has been circulating online for some time. While Franny remains hopeful that someone will come to their aid, Harold is less optimistic. As Harold offers to help her, Franny reprimands him and tells him to leave. After a tense confrontation with Harold, Franny buries her father in the family garden. Meanwhile, a radio broadcast features the President of the United States, who is displaying symptoms of the disease, firmly denying that the outbreak was engineered by the government. As the broadcast plays, Harold finds a police car, where he swiftly grabs a gun from the driver's seat. Returning home, he begins typing on his typewriter as the power goes out. After falling asleep following the broadcast, Franny dreams of Mother Abagail, who urges her to come to Hemingford home, Colorado to visit her. In the meantime, Stu is transferred from confinement to a new, supposedly secure location. Before the move, Dr. Ellis introduces him to Dr. Cobb, who will be joining their team. Stu is then escorted, wearing a mask, to an underground facility where he will be held. At the new facility, Stu and Dr. Ellis have a casual conversation. As Dr. Ellis is leaving, he starts coughing just as he heads out the door. Later that day, Harold arrives at Franny's house and calls out to her several times, but she doesn't answer. Growing concerned, he goes inside and finds Franny passed out in the bathtub with pills scattered around her. Harold manages to save her, and she eventually coughs up the pills and starts breathing heavily. After preventing her from ending her life, Harold reminds her of the encouragement she once gave him by hanging his first rejection letter on the wall. As Franny begins to recover, Harold reveals his plan. Given that the virus has a 99% fatality rate, and they are among the few who have survived, he persuades Franny, whom he secretly admires, to join him on his motorbike. He is armed with a pistol he took from a dead police officer. They decide to head to Atlanta and turn themselves into the CDC for testing to find out more about the virus. The next morning, they set out and start driving along the road. In a dream, Stu finds himself in a crop field, hearing the cries of children. As he investigates, he encounters a wolf standing in the middle of the field. He abruptly wakes up from this unsettling dream. Later, Dr. Ellis enters the room with a small folding knife, coughing heavily. Stu learns that the virus has choked nearly everyone it has infected. Dr. Ellis also reveals that Dr. Cobb is infected. While they are talking, Cobb arrives with his swollen throat, and he intends to kill both Stu and Dr. Ellis. As Cobb moves to attack Stu after killing Dr. Ellis, Stu manages to slit Cobb's throat, stopping him from carrying out further violence. General William Starkey, a four-star commander, then leads Stu outside the confinement. The exit leads Stu to General Starkey, 
who confirms that he has lost contact with the outside world, having last communicated with someone two days ago. He also confirms that Cobb was not under his supervision and that he does not know to whom Cobb reported. Surrounded by monitors, the general explains his contingency plans. As he stifles a cough, he instructs Stu to leave and inform any survivors that he stayed at his post and fulfilled his duty until the end. The general then pulls a revolver and takes his own life. Meanwhile, Stu is seen running out of the building. As the scene shifts back to the present, Harold is helping the crew dispose of all the infected bodies into a large container. While working, he narrates his version of the story typing it out on his typewriter. Later, Harold experiences a vivid dream where he sees a wolf in a desert. The wolf then transforms into a man dressed in denim, who gestures for Harold to join him and hands him a glowing red rock. Upon waking, Harold finds that it was just a dream. Later that day, he reunites with Franny and Stu, who are clearly a couple, spending time together at their base. Franny is also noticeably pregnant. To hide his true intentions, Harold forces a smile, mimicking the grin he saw on Tom Cruise's magazine cover. Privately, he intends to kill both Stu and Franny. An additional flashback reveals the origins of the apocalypse where Campion was exposed to the disease while stationed in California. The mysterious man in denim then prevented the station from going into lockdown, allowing Campion to escape and spread the infection. Campion rushes home wakes his wife, Sally, and urges her to leave the house immediately. They quickly flee and drive out of town. On the way, the man in denim asks for a ride, but Campion does not stop. Despite this, the man mysteriously appears inside the vehicle and grins at the impending chaos. In the next scene, a group of survivors is shown gathered together inside a department store. Nadine Cross, a teacher, and a young orphan named Joe are in one of the tents when they are visited by Larry Underwood, a young musician. He is leading a small group of cars to Boulder, Colorado, which includes Nadine and Joe. Upon their arrival, Stu and the other survivors greet them warmly. Stu gives Larry a ride into town, and they talk about Mother Abagail, who brought them all together. During their conversation, it is revealed that Larry was initially following Harold. Later, Nadine and Franny also meet up. Franny asks Nadine to look after Joe, and Nadine agrees to take on the responsibility. Eventually, Larry reaches town where Stu introduces him to the other residents. Larry is then directly brought to meet Mother Abagail. In Arizona, the low-level criminal Lloyd Henry is arrested and thrown into jail. His cellmate, George, introduces himself and informs Lloyd that he has been making headlines. It turns out Lloyd has been falsely accused of being a cop killer. A flashback shows Lloyd entering a small convenience store with the intention of robbing it. However, his unstable companion shoots one of their hostages. The same companion also kills a nearby police officer. As other officers rush into the store, they quickly subdue Lloyd and pin him to the ground. In the present, the virus reaches the jail, but the officers are reluctant to release any of the prisoners. This is especially true for Lloyd, who is labeled a cop killer after the shootout. The flashback to five months earlier shows Larry in New York when the contagion first hit. He is forced to perform solo on stage before a sparse audience, including his mother. During the concert, Larry's old roommate and drug dealer, Wayne, accuses him of stealing his hit single. Their argument turns into a brawl, overshadowing Larry's performance and casting a dark cloud over his future career prospects. In the morning, Larry wakes up to a call from the hospital about his mother, Alice. She has been admitted with a severe cough. As Larry navigates through the crowded hallways of the hospital, he realizes the plague has spread widely. When he reaches his mother, she tells him to find his father, who is at a bar with a photographer. While Larry is taking his mother home to rest, Wayne, unable to let go of his grudge, confronts him. As Larry watches his mother struggle to breathe, he is forced to watch her die. While Wayne also succumbs to the disease, Larry gathers the stash of drugs hidden in his boot along with a gun and leaves. As the contagion devastates the city and chaos takes over, Larry falls asleep in Central Park. The following day, Larry meets a woman named Rita Blakemore, who has lost her husband to the disease. They find comfort in each other's company and end up spending the night together at her apartment. However, they soon realize they need to leave the city, which is filled with 8 million decaying bodies, behind. The next morning, Rita and Larry set out, walking through the eerily empty streets of New York. They come across a man with a suitcase full of money who asks Larry to hand over Rita and take all the money. Larry refuses, leading to a tense chase. The man, along with two other companions, starts pursuing them. To escape, Larry and Rita flee into the sewers. As they navigate the underground tunnels, Rita panics at the sight of the rats and climbs out of the sewer. Larry disagrees with her decision and lets her leave alone. As Larry navigates the sewers alone, he is haunted by a crow that brings frightening visions of his deceased mother. These unsettling images, including rats crawling out of her mouth, terrify him. 
desperate to escape, Larry tries to climb out of the sewer, but he struggles with the heavy manhole cover. Rita arrives just in time to help, removing the cover and allowing Larry to finally get out. They then make their way across the George Washington Bridge, leaving the city behind them. Later that night, Rita appears overwhelmed by the horrors she has witnessed and feels that her continued survival is pointless. Soon, she fatally overdoses on pills as Larry sleeps. In the present, Larry takes Joe and Nadine to a temporary home and shows them to their individual rooms. She inquires about his conversation with Mother Abagail, but Larry responds that she instructed him not to share any details of their discussion. He then explains that he plans to go out in search of Harold. Nadine asks if he can take Joe with him so she can have some time to set up the room. Larry agrees to her request. Now in Boulder, Larry has transformed from the man he was when he left New York City. He is now a responsible guardian for Joe and appears to have overcome his addiction to cocaine and other drugs. Larry brings Joe along to meet Harold and personally express his gratitude for the notes Harold left for others. However, Joe senses a deep-seated anger and darkness within Harold, which prompts Larry to cut their meeting short. In the prison, Lloyd is left as the sole survivor. Desperate, he resorts to eating rats and even gnaws on his cellmate's leg. Just when hope seems lost, a mysterious man named Randall Flagg appears. Introducing himself, Flagg produces a key from a glowing red rock to unlock Lloyd's cell, but only on the condition that Lloyd pledges his loyalty and becomes his right-hand man. Hungry and desperate, Lloyd agrees eagerly. After unlocking his cell, Flagg hands Lloyd a glowing red rock and promises him the opportunity to lead and seek revenge. The two set off together, beginning their new alliance. The scene shifts to an orphanage where four girls, including Nadine Cross, are gathered. They use a Ouija board with a planchette and a pencil to try and contact the spirit world. When Nadine touches the planchette, it writes her name on the paper. The planchette then moves on its own. Carving the message Nadine will be my queen into the wooden floor, causing chaos among the girls. However, this turns out to be a dream as Nadine wakes up in Boulder, breathing heavily. She is awake by the distant sound of gunshots from a hunting party, which includes Larry Underwood and Stu Redman. When the hunters return home empty-handed, they are almost struck by a sports car driven by a man from Las Vegas. The man, covered in blood from crucifixion wounds, warns them that someone is coming for them and their community in Colorado before collapsing from blood loss. As Nadine gets ready to leave the school in Boulder and provide some stability for the children, flashbacks show how she first met Larry. While traveling, Nadine had to stop Joe from attacking Larry with a knife. Once Joe calms down, the three of them come together. Nadine explains that she found the quiet boy just outside Scranton, and Larry is following messages left by Harold Lauder. In another flashback from four months earlier, Harold encounters Stu Redman while stopping on the road with Franny. Harold isn't too thrilled to meet another survivor, and the two eventually go their separate ways. Franny and Harold continue their journey toward Atlanta, while Stu heads west with the aim of reaching California before winter arrives. In the present, Larry and Stu bring the man with crucifixion wounds to Boulder's medical facilities for care. At the same time, Franny Goldsmith, who is pregnant, is being examined at the clinic. Nick Andros, a resident in Boulder, is at the infirmary when he sees Stu and Larry bringing in the wounded man. Curious, Nick quickly scribbles a note asking if the man is from Las Vegas. Nick remembers drifting through a small town looking for work just before the Captain Trips outbreak began. As a deaf man, he unintentionally angered a barfly who then blinded him during a bar fight with his ring. While Nick was recovering in a nearby hospital, he had a vision of Randall Flagg offering him a deal to join him and receive his hearing voice, and sight back. Nick firmly refused the offer. He later woke up in the hospital after the pandemic, where he was tending to the man who had blinded him during his final moments. Nick then has a vision of Mother Abagail, an elderly woman he can communicate with. When he asks her about her identity, she introduces herself as the oldest living person chosen by the Lord to speak on his behalf. She invites Nick to join her in Colorado, and become her voice in the community she plans to build. Nick is initially skeptical, feeling that no one values what he has to offer. However, Mother Abagail reassures him that their task is to create a new world, which can only be achieved if they work together. Before she departs, she asks him to come and find her in Hemingford home in Colorado. When Nick wakes up from his vision, he finds himself face to face with Tom Cullen, a mentally disabled man. Communication between them is difficult as Nick cannot speak, and Tom cannot read or understand sign language. Tom, who never stops talking, follows Nick everywhere and talks about various subjects, which frustrates Nick. Despite his irritation, Nick learns that Tom also had a vision of Mother Abagail. Tom mentions that she gave him clues to find Nick. Although Nick is annoyed by Tom's constant chatter, he eventually reads Tom's lips and realizes that Tom's vision was similar to his own. At the stadium, Larry, Nadine, 
and Joe are spending time together. Larry's guitar performance catches Joe's attention, and Joe is clearly impressed. Inspired, Joe climbs up to where Larry is and asks for some guitar lessons. Larry happily agrees and starts to show Joe how to play. Joe takes the guitar and begins playing demonstrating that he has some skill. However, as he continues, his hand starts to hurt. Despite Larry's offer to help him with another lesson, Joe declines, preferring to manage on his own without Larry's assistance. Additional flashbacks reveal the journey of the characters toward Boulder. One such meeting involves Stu encountering Glenn Bateman, a retired college professor who is accompanied by his loyal golden retriever, Kajak. Their initial meeting goes smoothly, and Glenn invites Stu to his home. There, Glenn serves some of his finest dishes, and the two bond over their shared experiences of loss. Glenn tells Stu that he lost his wife a decade ago, while Stu shares that his wife passed away just a year earlier. They spend the evening together, connecting deeply and enjoying each other's company. The next morning, as Stu is exploring the house, he comes across several paintings leaning against the floor. Among them, he spots a painting of an elderly woman. He wakes Glenn, who is asleep on the couch and shows him the painting, asking if he knows anything about the woman. Glenn, still groggy, is unsure about the identity of the old woman. Stu asks Glenn if they might have had the same dream about her. Glenn quickly dismisses this idea, suggesting that the elderly woman in the painting is likely someone from an advertisement or commercial, possibly selling detergent, which is why they both recognize her. Stu then tells Glenn that the woman in the painting is Mother Abagail and reveals that she instructed him to find her in Colorado, near Boulder. Glenn listens and then clarifies that the specific location is actually Hemingford home. The painting of Mother Abagail prompts Stu to look through the other artworks scattered on the floor. He soon finds another painting that he recognizes. It is of Franny, who is pregnant. Stu shows this painting to Glenn and tells him it depicts the same woman he met the previous day. Glenn points out that Stu had not mentioned that she was pregnant. Stu explains that Franny was not visibly pregnant, when they met, or at least he did not notice her pregnancy. Glenn then explains that he painted the picture three days ago. In Boulder, the ruling committee is in the midst of a heated debate about what to do after the warning from the crucified man. Glenn proposes that they should inform the other residents about the man, allowing them to come up with their own interpretation of the situation. However, Nick argues that this could cause widespread panic among the public. Unable to reach a consensus, Glenn suggests that the best course of action is to hold a vote to decide their next steps. While they are still discussing, Mother Abagail arrives to speak with the man herself. As Mother Abagail takes the man's hand, he begins to breathe heavily. When he wakes up and sees her, he tells her that he had dreamt of her and then begins to describe his experiences. He explains that he has come from a terrible place where he encountered a man whom he believes to be a devil. The man begins to describe Flag and the dark, sinister community he leads in Las Vegas. He talks about how this group has slaves and conducts brutal crucifixions. As he speaks, his wounds start to reopen in a horrifying way, and he becomes possessed by Flag. Flag, now speaking through the man, threatens to destroy the community that Mother Abagail has worked so hard to bring together. The man eventually dies from his wounds, and Harold is the one who later buries him. In the final scene, Nadine is lost in a vision from Flag, who orders her to join forces with Harold and eliminate Abagail along with her key supporters in Boulder. Amid the vision, Nadine recalls receiving a mysterious glowing red rock during her childhood while playing planchette with her friends. Just as she is deeply engaged in her communication with Flag, Joe unexpectedly enters the room disrupting her focus and breaking her connection with flag. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on the notification, and leave 1000 likes or 100 comments if you'd like us to continue part 2. Thank you.